Hello. Um, uh, my name is Young Kim, and um, thanks for attending this session. Um, today, I'm um, I'm going to talk about payments and penalties in ecosystem services program. Uh, this is a joint work with Eric Lichtenberg and Dave Newbern in our department. Um, we would much appreciate any of the comments and and feedback to improve the anal analysis. Um, let's get started. Um, Agriculture sector has been provided uh, less eco ecosystem services than necessary to the society. For example, there's a lack of conservation practice adoption um, to protect watershed. And one of the primary approach taken by many uh, government in many different countries are payments for ecosystem services program, which offer financial incentive um, to for those who voluntarily adopt conservation practice. And General features of these program is um, these these con programs has medium to long term contract. If you think about objective of the program, um, it takes time to recover soil health or recover water water quality, right, and restore biodiversity. So the contract term is usually five to twenty years, and there's a combination of off farm payment, one time off farm payment, and a, a series of annual payment to compensate the uh, opportunity cost of land, land use. And there's a non-completion penalty aspect um, feature, which is focus our focus of our study. And with, because of the contract is pretty long, um, there's a chance that farmer wanna terminate the contract before expiration date. So when they, for example, um, in a CRP, um, farmers convert their highly erodible cropland to grass cover, let's say. And during the 10 year period contract, they, wanna, they might wanna terminate the contract and produce crop instead. So they wanna get rid of the grass cover and produce crop again. Then in that case, government wanna want them to pay back penalty, early termination penalty. And the standard existing, existing standard penalty structure in, in, the, in the conservation policy is that government requires them to pay, participants to pay back all payments, total payments they have received so far, okay? And, and this penalty is interesting um, policy instrument because it affects, it reduces contract um, all determination, but at the same time, it affects participation incentive as well. Because if you're a farmer that has non-zero chance of contract all determination during the contract period, then having high penalty in the, in the offer contract will disincentivize eligible farmers to in, initially in, enroll in the program. So, so our um, research objective is to examine optimal penalty structure in the PS program. So, so we conduct theoretical analysis to derive optimal penalty structure and compare it with the standard existing penalty structure. And we're going to combine that theoretical result with the existing policy, uh, policy parameters um, to conduct numerical policy simulation. And the focus is we want to examine the magnitude of differences between the optimal penalty structure that we drive and then the standard existing penalty structure. And then the next step is, you know, uh, compare the net policy, uh, net program benefits under each penalty structure and, and see if the difference is significant. And here's a preview of the findings. We find that uh, optimal penalty structure and standard existing penalty structure is, is fundamentally different. Um, and, and we find inefficiencies from um, standard existing penalty is pretty large. So when you think about the standard penalty structure, it directly ties penalty to payments, right? So you need to pay back what you have received. When you when you when the farmer terminate the contract, so this coupling penalty with total payments could be really inefficient. If you think about um, any payment increase to to encourage farmers participation in these conservation policies, can create simultaneously increase in penalty, which which again undermines the participation incentives. So I want to point out that inefficiencies. Um, from this paper. I wanna briefly talk about existing literature 
So existing studies have, have been um, largely focused on payments, how to restructure payments and how to allocate um, payments to different her heterogeneous landowners or farmers to increase participation rate or cost effectiveness of these P PS programs, right? But then our paper is, is focusing on um, penalty rather than payments. And also we're focusing on contract performance after the initial sign up, okay? So the initial participation is not the end of the story, right? Because it, the contract is usually five to 20 years uh, long. And even though many people sign up the contract, if the contract performance is low, then um, the uh, cost effectiveness of these programs are, are pretty low. So I wanna briefly talk about the multi-period PS contract that we consider in the model. So at time zero, farmer, eligible farmer considers, um, risk neutral farmer considers um, the enrollment part participation decision. So they have initial expectation on crop return during the contract period. And if they do not enroll in the contract, then they continue to produce crop. And if they enroll in the contract, only if the expected benefit, expected return from program enrollment is greater than crop production, right? Um, then they, they are required to install the practice, conservation practice, and receive off-farm payment and annual first annual payment. And then from, from time one to time capital T minus one, uh, there's a random shock that affects, that alters farmer's initial expectation on crop return during the contract period, okay? There's a, there's a spike in crop price and, there, that, and that random shock will change farmer's initial expectation on crop return throughout the contract period, okay? And then, and then that, the density of the random shock will create probability of contract termination and, and probability that the contract is maintained throughout the country. And then that, that's gonna be repeated at each time. And in case of contract early termination, the, penalty, uh, the farmer is required to pay for the penalty. And then, and then that penalty schedule is from P1 to um, P capital T minus one over there. So, so this, this, this random shock is the only, random shock epsilon is the only random component in our model. And, and I'm gonna shrink this decision tree into one equation now to, to talk about participation condition. So, so this is the, so don't, don't get intimidated by this equation. So, so left-hand side is just um, expected program return, probability weighted. So there's a probability of contract termination and contract completion, right? So, so this equation, what this equation shows is probability weighted summation of program return in case of contract completion and contract non-completion, okay? So that's just left-hand side. And the right-hand side is the total expected crop return. So the, we're, we're considering risk neutral farmer and they're comparing expected return from each option. So, and then there's a government optimization problem, which is to maximize um, environment the benefit less program cost plus penalty revenue. This is gonna be net program benefits that we're considering. And, and they're choosing off from payment and penalty schedule from P1 to P capital T minus one. And, and this optimization problem, um, solving this optimization problem will um, give us the first theoretical result. And that is optimal penalty structure is equal, penalty level is equal to future net benefits lost due to contract termination. So, so optimal penalty structure considers, uh, considers future benefits, future environmental benefit lost due to contract termination. So in, in that sense is for looking, but um, standard penalty structure is only a function of total payments received so far at the, until the point of contract termination. And in that sense is backward looking. So, uh, so here I'm talking about 
how two penalty structures are qualitatively different in setting their levels. Okay. And then I wanna, now I wanna talk about the trends. The optimal penalty schedule level generally decreases over time during the contract period, um, especially because the environmental benefit, capital B is the environmental benefit there. And then environmental benefit less the annual payment here. That is likely to be positive if the government implements the, the PS program that generates net positive benefits, right? So on the other hand, the standard penalty structure monotonically, monotonically increases over time because the annual payment they, the farmer receive accumulates over time. So here I'm talking about the, the, the qualitative difference between the two penalty structure in setting their trends. And then the question is, whether or not this qualitative difference in penalty structures lead to quantitative difference in, in, in the two penalty schedules and also net program benefits. So we're, we're investigating magnitude of differences in the penalty schedules and also um, net environmental benefits. And we're, we're considering PS contract that converts cropland to grass buffer for 10 years. And we're considering re representative home farmer in the Chesapeake Bay region. And environmental benefit we're, we're measuring is that reduction of nutrients and sediments runoff and the deliver to the Chesapeake Bay. So um, this is the uh, first policy, numerical policy simulation result. And, and the blue line is the standard penalty. So standard uh, non-completion penalty monotonically, monotonically increases over time, more than triples here. So the reason is obvious, you know, the, the annual payments farmers receive increases over time. So, um, yeah, it's just when the farmer want to terminate the contract in the first year of the contract, then they, they might just have to pay back one year annual payment plus upfront payment, right? But then that's going to increase over time. The lead dot line is, dash line is, the optimal penalty structure, and that's decreasing over time. And if you think about qualitative um, aspects of optimal penalty, when the farmers terminate the contract in the last period, right, then what government loses is just one period of environmental benefit, less annual payment, right? So net environmental benefit loss due to contract termination is small. And, and at the end of the contract, or close to the closing to the contract, um, expiration date. So, so we see um, the two penalty structures are uh, total, fundamentally different in levels and trend here. And then I want to talk about you know net net program benefits. So, the the second column off from payment is the the amount of payment that ensures farmers' participation in this program, and that is greater under the optimal penalty structure which means that um, farmers are more disincentivized um, under the optimal penalty structure. Be and th the reason is, is, is obvious here. You know, the penalty is high off-run. Optimal penalty is large off-run. So, so farmers are um, disincentivized to enroll in the program. So the government has to pay more to them to bring them in into the program. But the total environmental benefit is much greater under the optimal penalty structure because the standard penalty level is very low on, um, in the earlier contract period, right? And that's going to increase contract non-completion in the, in the earlier contract period, okay? And, and a, as a result, the annual payment expenditure is lower under the standard penalty, but the penalty revenue is greater. So I mean, all, combining all that aspects, uh, all that components, net program benefit increased by 19% under the optimal penalty structure. So, so this is the this is the um, main result, and let me wrap up uh, with the two main takeaway message here. So, from the theoretical result. For theoretical analysis, we show that optimal penalty structure is 
is qualitatively different from standard penalty structure, right? And then, and then that leads to quantitative, quantitative differences in, in the two penalty schedule, as we saw that cross line in the previous figure. And, and, the, and the, the, the optimal penalty structure is for looking in the sense that it cares about future benefit loss due to contract termination, but standard penalty structure is backward looking in the sense that it only considers payments paid, already paid to, to farmer. And, this, and the second takeaway message is direct coupling of penalty to payment is inefficient because any payment increase in, in, the, in conservation policy to, to encourage farm, eligible farmers to um, participate in this program will simultaneously increase penalty level because the penalty level is equal to total payments amount. And, and that's gonna undermine the participation incentive, increasing participation incentive due to payment increase, right? So, so we're, the conclusion here is that then environment the benefits from the PS contract may increase significantly when we just restructuring the current um, standard penalty structure in the, in the CRP, CRAP, EQIP and CSP, um, those ma major farm bill programs. I think that's um, all I have. Thanks for the attention. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I'm the discussant Mani Ruhirat, assistant professor at Texas A&M University. And so I really like this paper. I think the, the message is very intuitive and very clear when you read the paper and that the current incentive structure, the way it is set up, is uh, discourages discourages participants from participating in the program. And when they participate in the program, they want to get out of the program earlier because the later, the more they stay, they are going to pay more. So they want to get out at the beginning, and that is when the benefits are going to be realized actually going forward. And the current structure, in a way, is very ineffective because now you have to pay based on the history of the amount you receive, which is totally counterintuitive. And that, this message is laid out very effectively in the paper. And I really like that, that it's very intuitive and it's very easy to understand. Now, the, the optimal policy design, as I put it here, looks forward, right? But then I think about what is an optimal policy design. And this is what I was trying to think about as I was reading through the paper. From the point of the view of the government, so this is the, one of those last slides that the objective function for the government is that upfront payment minus the fixed costs and the penalties received. And when I think about the government, I think of a government trying to maximize social welfare in a way that the cost of the participation is the lost profits due to participating in the program and the benefits of participation in the benefits that are provided from environmental benefits generated. So for me, the objective for the government really should be that the net benefits in terms of benefits generated and the opportunity cost of that land participating in the program. So that this type of policy, the, the, the optimal, so any of the money that is transferred from the participants to the government in terms of penalty and any money transferred from the government to the 
uh, to the participants is overall a transfer that just cancel out in the social welfare function, right? They all cancel out each other. So for me, those are not an important part of the optimal policy design. And that becomes important because towards the end, when you discuss what is efficient and what is not efficient, efficiency for me is that of a social objective function that maximizes the social welfare. But then that becomes very interesting there that the, object, the objective function in a way we can, if you have everyone already participated in the program, if we set the penalty very high, nobody will get out of the program anymore. So they are locked in, they have to pay, pay millions of dollars if they decide to get out of the program. So they're already locked in. But what that does then discourages them from participating in the program. So there's a trade-off between uh, encouraging participation and discouraging living of the program. And I think some of that trade-offs can be laid out a little bit more clearly in the paper in a way that I think about what is the extent of that market? How substitutable are different producers with each other? So if a producer leaves a program, they should pay the amount that the government will then use to bring in the, the next best land into the program. So in a way, that is how I think about the government's problems, that the amount that you should be paying is the benefits you generated, but how much you need to, we, the government needs to receive to generate the benefits from an alternative second alternative source that generates the same amount of benefit. So that is kind of the bigger picture type of thing. I point I had about the paper that kind of my thoughts, I had some more minor thoughts, if you will, about the paper, how to, as I was reading through the paper, Okay, just quickly that I say that in terms of the motivation, there are programs like CRP or CREP that are 10 years. And it would be nice to see whether we see individuals leaving the program in the first couple of years or they actually the distribution of the time that they leave the program. And when you present some of the results for some of the theor theoretical results, I think some of that uh, intuition might help as well. One thing that I think would be very helpful in laying out the paper would be that after you generate the theoretical results, it would be nice to say, okay, let's apply this to a few different types of ecosystem services that are very different. Some of them are stocks, some of them are flows, some of them generate benefits over time because they are stocks. So some of these and show that the payments, the penalty structure is very different across these things. So that's basically, and I, the last point that maybe we can discuss later is that this rental model of ecosystem services, that what if I pay you for every year of the benefits you generate, that this kind of like carbon sequestration type of literature that they're thinking about is what if we rent carbon ecosystem services from the producers? It is stock, but we are renting them from the producers. So those are my comments for, am I the next presenter myself or? Oh yeah. yeah. All right, this is very convenient that I'm the next presenter. So I'm the second author, Mani Ruhirad. The, the co-authors on this paper is Dale Manning, who is at Colorado State University in the Ag and Resource Economics Department, and Stephen Ogo, who is, I think, in the Social Science Department. But in Colorado, both of them are at Colorado State Universities. So, as you know, uh, US officially rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement uh, last year, basically. And part of this voluntary part of the uh, uh, joining the uh, Paris Climate Accord was that providing uh, uh, soil sequestration and climate services partly through agricultural and climate smart agricultural practices. For example, through cover crops or til tillage practices, or even restoration of uh, certain agricultural practices and certain agricultural management policies. This type of agricultural practices can take carbon off the soil, the, the atmosphere and sequester it in the soil. But not only that, 
they can, also, they can also reduce the N2O emissions or nitrous oxide emissions from the agricultural production. So they kind of pro provide two types of services at the same time, changing or uh, modifying agricultural conservation practices in a way. When we look at some of the more biophysical literature on the potential for agricultural lands or for lands in general for, for contributing to this uh, climate externality, they suggest that there is a very large potential in terms of 10% of annual emissions, for example, to be able to be evaded through agricultural conservation practices. But as we know, and as we know, there are too many, uh, there are many public and private efforts that are going on right now for contributing to this debate. For example, uh, companies like Nori or Indigo Act that they are providing payments, voluntary payments to agricultural producers through uh, carbon offset markets for them to uh, implement certain practices to sequester carbon and to reduce their emissions. At the same time, we have lots of government support, uh, technical support programs that are being implemented right now for agricultural producers that are incentivized through the government payments that will provide similar services. And we are seeing an increasing climate star smart type of funding that are hoping to change the practices that agricultural produ producers use to provide this type of services. For example, the Partnership for Climate Smart uh, Commodities is providing, for example, up to $1 million through USDA to agricultural producers for certain type of practices. Or even through, the, through Congress, Growing Climate Solutions Act provides technical assistance to agricultural producers for policy, for practices that will sequester carbon and reduce emissions from agricultural production. Well, well there, is, there seems to be a lot of scope, at least from the biophysical side, on the, on the potential for agricultural lands to contribute to this debate. When we think about the larger scale, whether these actually these things can take place, when we think about the economics of it, the economic viability of it still remains unclear. Whether the potential, physical potential exists and whether the economic potential exists are two different things. And this is partly very important because of the significant heterogeneity that exists in a lot of agricultural lands. For example, in terms of soil type, weather and climate condition, the existing land use and practice history, and soil carbon levels that exist already in the agricultural lands. So it's really important to consider all these things. And when we consider all this heterogeneity, we may not have, uh, we may not have as much potential as we think in agricultural lands. And besides that, uh, literature have shown that these changes in soil uh, carbon sequestration services may not be permanent. For example, agricultural producers who participate may leave these programs or maybe there is leakage in terms of the amount of carbon sequestered. So we have two objectives really in this, uh, in this research. We want to first, an empirical question that we want to look at is, how much can working agricultural lands contribute to the GHG abatement uh, policy question as a function of the price of carbon that will be paid to agricultural producers. And there are different ways to think about it, incentivizing adoption of different uh, practices. But what we are thinking of here, at least in the presentation today, we are thinking about tillage choices. For example, no till or reduced till as an alternative to full till. But also we have another alternative here is we want to understand how do discrete choice models affect this empirical supply curves for GHG abatement services. So we look at different specifications, for example, with or without different controls, but we are also interested in this conventional or conditional logit compared to the mixed logit type of comparison and what that means for the flexibility or for the elasticity of that supply curve. In future, we are hoping to do different types of uh, discrete choice models and to be able to compare them together and see what their policy implications are for the supply of carbon sequestration services and n two emissions. So what we are going to do is we are going to estimate the discrete choice model with the existing practices his, that we have historically for Iowa and then simulate different policy simulations for different prices of carbon to be able to generate the supply curve basically for provision of soil sequestration and N2O emissions 
for in general for carbon uh, services. And there are two groups of literature. There is a more recent group of literature that studies the discrete, discrete choice modeling of crop and practice choices at the farm level that these studies use discrete choice models that kind of we are using the same multinomial logic or mixed multinomial logic type of models and compare the, the outcomes of these models and the welfare implications of those. For example, one of the more recent papers by Oz et al, they, look, they compare the effect of salinity on crop choice decisions and they show that this uh, heterogeneity is very important uh, for understanding preferences over, over salinity on crop choice. Another group of literature studies the GHG emission. This is more of a GHG emission literature that model crop and practice choices, some of them. And the other ones uh, study, the, uh, study the preferences, you, uh, model the general equilibrium type of models and compare different types of policies. So we are going to use an empirical discrete choice model to model producers' historical preferences through their historical decisions, and then use simulations to be able to simulate the supply curve. The data that we are going to use are more than around 13,000 observations using the natural resource inventory or NRI point in Iowa. This data uh, is a panel data set. So we observe their land use choices. We, we also observe some form of their tillage uh, choices as well. We don't exactly know what uh, their location. We know at this point, we only know that they are in Iowa, but in the future, we are going to uh, know which county they are located in as well. So we know some spatial distribution of these points as well. But at this point, we only know that they are in Iowa and all our data right now is from Iowa. We are hoping to expand that to entire Corn Belt in the near future. And this data and this modeling that we are using in this analysis is very important because this data is used for reporting the actual emissions of the US to the IPCC and to the EPA. So this data that we have is uh, used by the US government as well. And the data goes back to 1981. So we have around 30 years of the data that for the producers that grow corn and soy. So we have more producers in there, but we only focus on corn and soy and tillage practices for now. And the variables that we get from this data set include crop choice, practice choice, their yields that are modeled with the descent model, which is an ecosystem simulation type of model, but is used for this uh, analysis. And we don't actually observe the yield, actual yields at the parcel level, but this model, uh, the descent model that simulates changes in carbon sequestration, changes in N2 emissions, and the changes in crop yields basically is used for analysis and also fertilizer use. And we get the price, crop prices and fertilizer prices from the USDA data sets to be able to generate profitability of different crops. So as I said, we have two main crops that we are going to focus on, at least for today's presentation, for corn that are corn and soybean, and three different practices, full till, no till, and reduced till. As you can see, most of the crops are full till for both corn and soybean. There is variation in terms of the simulated revenue and fertilizer cost. So these are, to understand these columns, these are, these are simulated crop yields that then multiplied by the price of the uh, price of the crops, and these are simulated fertilizer amounts that are multiplied by the cost of fertilizer elements. Basically, so what we can see here is that full till reduces both crop yield and also has higher fertilizer costs. In terms of fertilizer costs, it makes sense that there is a the the tillage practices reduce the cost of fertilizer, they reduce the amount of fertilizer needed, but also that they keep moisture better as well. What we also see is, is that tillage practices tend to, full till practices tend to have higher emissions and lower carbon sequestration. So if we incentivize, if you pay producers, for, if you have a price for carbon, we should see an increase in till, no till and reduced till and a shift towards no till and reduced. But what we also see historically is that there has been an increase in no-till and reduced tilling, 
in the Corn Belt and, for example, in the state of Iowa. So we see a reduce, reduction in full till acreage and an increase in no till and reduced till acreage over time. And what that means is that we have, we have had an increase in the soil carbon sequestration over the past uh, couple of decades. And if you see this figure for the first time, that may look, that is interesting that it's not that we are depleting soil carbon resources, but because of both these pra uh, conservation practices and also because of fertilizer use, soil carbon, soil carbon has been increasing overall over time. But what that also means for policy is that if we incentivize the use of uh, conservation practices, even in the baseline, we are seeing an increase. So the policy needs to add carbon sequestration and reduce emission, even on top of the existing trends of increasing uh, carbon services. So it might give us a suggestion that the policy may have a small effect overall. So we are going to have a discrete choice model that, based, that is based on the random utility model. We are going to have a alternate, alternative specific constants for each of the crop practices. So for example, corn, no-till, corn reduced till, soybean no-till, et cetera. And what we are interested in is the average re net revenues or profits and the standard deviation of net revenues. We wanna know how they affect the preferences over crop choice for producers. We have other controls as well, like lag crop choice. And we also allow year specific time trends that their coefficients are crop and practice specific. So they allow for heterogeneity across crops, crops and practices. And then we have an uh, unobserved portion of the utility that we make certain assumptions so that we can represent it as a multinomial logit and mixed multinomial logit model. So I'm going to briefly show the results of the multinomial and, or conditional logit and mixed uh, multinomial logit model. Because the results are overall very similar in terms of what they show, I'm going to just briefly mention what these columns are. The first column is the conditional logit model without any controls. The uh, next column is conditional logit model with controls, which include year and crop, a large crop effect that vary across different crops and alternatives. And the last two columns are mixed multinomial logit models. In this column, we assume that expected uh, profits or net revenues are normally distributed so that we don't impose a specific distribution on that. It doesn't have to be positive. But in the last column, we impose a positive uh, requirement. And so the distribution is log normal. So our net revenues have to be positive. So we force that uh, in terms of distribution. And what we find overall is that the utility of the corn full till is higher than the other. Uh, relative to corn full till, they're all negative, which means that the profitability of corn full till is higher and it's being selected more often. But also that we find that average profits, as they increase, the utility gets higher and then the crop and practice is more likely to be selected. At the same time, producers don't like variability and as standard deviations increase, they tend to decrease the utility and for selecting a specific crop. And the mixed multinomial logit models show significant heterogeneity in terms of responses to net revenues and uh, standard deviation of net revenues. And then we get these preferences and then we simulate different uh, for different prices. We first draw an epsilon term from the unobservable part from the extreme value distribution. We estimate the V hat here based on the coefficients that we estimated and based on the values for each of the points. And then we estimate the total utility. We find the maximum utility. And then we simulate for different prices of uh, carbon, basically. We have certain, we have different levels of CO2 equivalent prices and we estimate the expected and standard deviation of net revenues. And then we simulate that for those levels. We simulate that for those different prices for, uh, and we get the supply curve basically. What we find is that overall the supply curve can be very different across different practices, uh, across different modeling assumptions. The more we heterogeneity we allow, the more elastic it will become. And as we include controls, the supply curve tend to be uh, more elastic as well. And then we also see that most of the services come from soil carbon sequestration rather than in reduction in N2O emission for any given level, uh, given price. I'm going to go into my time a little bit, then I can take it from the questions if that's. So what we find overall is that when we compare these results from these supply curves, we find that the scope for a carbon offset market from agricultural production 
overall is very limited when we think about the volumes that can be sequestered. Let's think about the uh, CO2 equivalent price of $15 per ton. In that case, using the different supply curves that we have, we end up somewhere between 0.00002 and 0.0006% of annual emissions for the entire US, which is a very small percentage of that. In the most optimistic one, that if we think about the mixed multinomial logic model, we end up with 0.0006% of the annual emissions for the US. And even if you assume the price of $100 per ton of car CO2 equivalent, we still end up with 0.004% of the annual emissions for the US. So the scope for this carbon offset market is really limited relative to the baseline. And what we may think about if we, this is for Iowa and we want, we want to expand this model to the entire US. Well, Iowa still has a lot of potential compared to the rest of US. And if we expand it to the entire US, we end up with somewhere around 0.04% of the annual emissions at the price of $100 per ton of CO2 equivalent. So at the end of the day, the scope for this carbon sequestration market is very limited. Overall, this is part of the tool set that the government or the marketplace can use, but the scope for it is very limited. And yeah, thank you. Any slides? Um, sorry, I, I have one simple thing. Um, due to the time limitation, I mean, you didn't mention his next steps to kind of improve the uh, their papers. One thing I would like to emphasize is that um, they use uh, they use the uh, uh, tillage data uh the same uh, use a constant constant tillage data between the five years so uh to improve the accuracy they mentioned that they may use the satellite satellite imager data um i do see some variations of the ct adoption between years when i do my study so that will be very helpful to improve the the whole research um Yeah, I think I will just uh, give the simple comments. Um, any questions for oh, many? Go ahead. Uh, uh, so I, I, I really like this question. Uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, I just have a question about it. Uh, so you mentioned that the carbon offset market is Yeah, that's a really good question. So this is really like a point. Okay. I've seen the maps of those NRI points, how they pick it, and they have some statistical way to get to those points. So they zoom in into the land more and more statistically, and then they get to a part of land that is kind of zoomed in. I, I, I forget what they call this specific, but then they point, pick an actual point from that part. And this point can be part of a farm, for example. And then that farm will become part of the NRI history. And yeah, so they then collect the data, I think, for the entire farm, not just only for that point. But the carbon itself, I think, for only that point, probably. I would just think that the Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think there are things that they just know about the points. Yeah, we struggle a little bit because these points are then representative of a larger area. Yeah. Right, right. I'm just curious what it exactly is represented. Yeah, 
the two slots and the very different ways to go over. So I think they try to, because those are statistical points that are selected, they want to represent the entire landscape randomly. So they try not to do that so that there are two points next to each other. At least there's a few pictures that I've seen how the points were selected. And I don't have access to those NRI points that where they are, it is part of our, one of our limitations. But the person that has access, they have showed us Stephen has access to those and they have showed us how like an NRI, NRI point will look like. And it sounds like it's just one point, one point in an area. So there are not two points next to each other that um, we... So I, I don't know if you want something like this, you know, because uh, the, the question you're asking is like, what is the point that you're trying to Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how to check. This just is on right. Yeah, I forgot to check that uh, for you. Yeah. Where is the? I don't yeah, know. Check. No. No, there's no. There's actually one. Thank you. Okay, I will get started. Uh, my name is Meng Lin Liu. I'm a PhD student at the University of Illinois at Abana Champaign. I'm going to talk my paper, The Effect of Conservation Tillage on Corn and Soybean Yields in the U.S. Corn Belt, a post-double selection method. Also, with some backgrounds for this research, the climate is changing. Extreme events are happening more often. The private initiatives in the government are taking actions to promote the adoption of conservation practices that sequester carbon in soils and vegetation. Um, conservation tillage as one of those practices has been recommended for adoption for years due to its environmental benefits. However, farmer concerns about yield loss might be an impediment to expanding its adoption. Many studies have been done based on field experiments uh, for, for assessing the yield effect of CT. The results are mixed due to variations in locations, weather, and soil conditions. To get a more generalized result, I'm interested in using the observational data to find the average effect of conservation tillage on corn and soybean yields in the US corn belt. There are only a few observational studies have been done on this topic. The two most recent ones, uh, Danis et al. 2019 and Chin et al. 2021. Both of the studies use the satellite imagery data for uh, CT adoption. Danis et al. 2019 applied causal forest uh, to uh, field level data without including any social economic variables. While well, Chen et al. 2021 used a linear fixed effect model on the county level data, including a few national and uh, state level socioeconomic variables. They found similar results. State adoption has no uh, negative effect on corn and soybean yields. However, both studies have some limitations. One of the concerns is uh, omitted variable bias. If the social economical 
variables that impact both both yield and state adoption at the same time, um, they may cause some issues. Um, besides the nonlinear, uh, the, the linear specification used in Chen et al. 2021 might not be the correct one since uh, yield or CT might be influenced by the quadratic terms or other nonlinear form. To address those issues, uh, I use a county level socioeconomic data set and to apply high dimensional measures to a more flexible model that allows the nonlinear non trend to interact with county level time varying characteristics. The county level data I used power uh, 631 counties across 11 states from 2005 to 2018. I use some of the data used in Chen et al. 2021, uh, such as corn soybean yields, city adoption rates, crop rotation rates, crop insurance rates, the state level price received and GM adoption rates, and fall for wetness and spring wetness. In addition to their data, I calculated a county level weighted average of some weather and climate variables. Uh, the county level socioeconomic data I used in the study, such as incomes, expenses, and the valuable inventory changes from USDA. I'd like to talk a little bit about my framework. Equations one, two are constructed following partial linear model. Delta Y, T is a difference of the log of the yield in county I in year T. Delta CTIT, the difference of the CT adoption rate in county I in year T. The first difference structure helped me to control the time inward characteristics. ZIT prime beta and ZIT prime gamma are approximations to the true functions. Uh, and the important assumption here to make the variable selection method, which I will talk about later, uh, valid is a uh, sparsity condition. Sparsity condition means that only a small number of non-zero coefficients in beta and gamma can make the approximation arrows small relative to the estimation arrow. CIT, the set of technical regressors um, made up of the differences and lacks of weather and socioeconomic variables. The initial levels and the initial differences of weather and the socioeconomic variables and the CT adoption rates. The quadratic terms of the preceding variables, the interactions between the differences and the interactions between all of the variables with time t and t squared. This set of variables corresponds to a cubic trend for the level of yield and CT adoption that is allowed to um, depending on county level of time varying characteristics. Mu IT and VIT here is the time fixed effect, uh, which capture the uh, national aggregated time trend. Equation three here is a reduced form corresponds to equation one. After the model is constructed, I apply the post double selection method to find the causal effective CT on yields. Step one, I apply lasso to equation two to select the important confounding factors. Step two, uh, I, apply, I apply, sorry, I, I apply lasso to equation three to select important factors um, in the equation of interest to make sure the residual variance are small. In the final step, I use the union of the selected technical regressors from step one, step two, and the fixed effect dummies as controls in the uh, OIS regression of delta Y T on delta C T I T. This causal inference relies on the sparsity condition I mentioned earlier. To examine the uh, double selection estimator, the performance of the double selection estimator, I also specified a 
linear fixed effect model. Um, WIT here is a set of variables derived from the differences and lags of the weather and socioeconomic variables. Before I jump into the results, I'd like to show you the variations of the different city for corn and soybeans that are captured by the data. Um, the, overall, the overall variations for, for the different city for corn is from the negative 16%, 60 percent to positive 60%. Most of the uh, most of the variations are between negative fifteen percent to uh, to positive fifteen percent. Some of them may be up to um, negative thirty percent to thirty uh, percent. We can see the similar patterns for the difference of the city adoption for soybeans. The outer layers a uh, little bit larger for soybeans. Uh, compared to for corn. Uh, from both graphs, we can see that the data captured the spatial and temporal variations of the CT adoption, the difference of the CT adoption. I used two sets of elementary variables in the two specifications I mentioned earlier. Um, I followed 10 out 2021 to determine the first set of variable. Uh, but I replaced, replaced some of the variables used in their study. I used the PDSI levels instead of the PDSI dummies um, to capture the year-to-year -year variations. I used the, I used the fertilizer and fuel expenses, the county level, instead of the national level fertilizer or fuel prices. Based on the variables in the uh, first set, I add some monthly weather and climate levels and JDD from April to October, paired labor expenses, production expenses, government, value of inventory changes of materials and supplies, and the lags of income runoff from April to October, value of inventory changes, higher labor expenses and government payment. Here are some results for corn. Um, in the first column, the conventional means uh, using the linear fixed effect model. Double selection means using the post double selection estimator. One, two represents the first set of variables and the second set of variables. The effect and the robustness standard arrow are reported um, following the median method used uh, using Chernozhukov et al. 2018. Uh, the effects of the CT adoption on corn uh, consists across models and the var variables used. There's no uh, significant effect of the CT adoption on corn. Um, the model performance is uh, pretty similar for corn and soybeans, so I'll mainly discuss model of performance in the results of soybeans. For the, so, uh, for the effects of the CT on soybeans, um, they, they are also consistent across models and the variables used. I find a negative, a significant negative effects of CT on soybeans. And both uh, both double um, both double selection estimators work uh, perform perform better uh, compared to the conventional estimator when using the for, uh, when using the same set of variables. Uh, the double selection process for the uh, for the first set of variables selected two hundred sixty four variables out of two hundred seventy variables, which means most of the variables in the model are important to predict uh, delta YIT or delta CTIT. This suggests uh, potential omitted variable bias. Double selection for the second set of uh, variables selected about 1,500 variables out of more than 14,000 variables. 
most of the variables uh, selected are the interactions between the weather and socioeconomic variables, all the always or without interacting with time t or time t square. Uh, this set of variables selected uh, represent uh, suggest uh, a nonlinear trend depends on uh, a county level temporary characteristics. Um, double selection estimator two um, performed the best. Uh, uh, if we look at the robust scenario confidence interval and uh, RMSE, um, the coefficient of the of this estimator can be interpreted as a ten percent increase in CT adoption less to about a, a half percent decrease in soybean yields. Uh, I will conclude my presentation with several key findings. CT adoption has no effect on corn and soybean yields. CT adoption has a very small negative effect on soybean yields. 10% increase in CT adoption leads to an average yield loss of 0.28 bushels per acre for soybeans. This can be translated to a loss of about a three, uh, 300, uh, 350 thousand US dollars for each county given soybean yields in 2022. Based on the model performance, the post double selection measure seems effective to minimize the omitted viral bias in this context. That's all I have. Uh, this is not a well po polished paper. Any questions or comments? Uh, um, really appreciate it. But how are you for my discussion? Sorry. Let me check if anyone has a question in the chat now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly talk about um, suggestions to improve the analysis of the paper. So I um, I have three main suggestions. So first thing is there are, um you know you have a bunch of control variables right in the analysis and and in the main result table the number of controls goes from like 100 to like 1500 or like, so additional like thousand or more than thousand variables are included in, in the analysis. And I just wanna, you know, it will be more helpful to categorize these control variables into three different types. You know, one affects um, both outcome and, and conservation utility adoption and yield, which will be confounding factors. And the second one will be um, controls that only affects ill. So that's going to increase the precision of the estimates in the model. And the third one is the variables that only affects conservation tillage. And, and think about um, which type of, which group of variables are, are likely to be selected under post double selection method versus, you know, um, in the conventional fixed effects model will um, inform us to think about where the estimate change is coming from, right? So the bias reduction is where the, the we can think about sign of the bias and, and uh, where that reduction is coming from. And, and you can also think about which type of, I mean, what kind of variables are included in, the, in each group. For example, main, mainly confounding factors will be soil variables or, or weather variables, knowing those, um, um, break, breaking down the total number of controls into diff these three different groups and, and um, information on um, variables that included in each group will, will be helpful. And, and then, then we can think about um, identification assumptions for causal estimates. So, you know, um, this, this increase in precision of the estimates and, and, and causal um, causal estimates or are, are whether or not whether or not the estimates are causal is a little um, different concept. So so I think 
this will be helpful. And the next next suggestion is, you know, one of the motivation of this paper was to overcome limited external ability of the field experiment. So I just wonder if you can explore spatial heterogeneity of the uh, treatment effect because you have uh, more than 600 counties across um, 12 or 12 states in Corn Belt region. So uh, they will have different soil types, precipitation and weather within the region. So I think um, one thing you can do is um, explore this heterogeneity. And, and based on that, uh, you can talk about, you know, policy implication of the analysis, um, which is now you can know, you can think about which region is the most likely or least likely to adopt conservation tillage without subsidy, right? Just based on impact on yield could be a little um, too much, but because like you can also think about crop return. You have all the information, production expenses, fertilizer um, usage and, and pesticides and so on, higher labor expenses. But I guess that those information is at the county level, not by crop type. So um, here are what I'm, where I'm sharing my thoughts on, you know, maybe you can, you can answer, um, you can have answer on which region is the most likely to adopt these conservation tillage without subsidy. Then, you know, how does that compare to current spatial distribution of um, payments, government payments for conservation tillage? And just this exercise will connect your paper to broader literature on additionality or optimal allocation of um, government payment on these um, conservation policies. So those are all I have. I'm just wondering because, um, like all the um, papers that I was trying to figure out, I'm just uh, thinking about like because you control for time to get that, maybe um, there is more time control for the time that's on the um, like control for both to get that, then it will be like, I guess, um, a good comparison to be like if there's a control there. Like, because uh, I, I, I don't know, um, I, I think it's like totally makes sense, like that you're trying to figure out what's happening, uh, like what other variables you want to uh, include so that you can actually, uh, I guess it's trying to work with not be kind of variable, but also, I mean, I, I think it's like high standard to have like a location, fixed, uh, fixed effect, I think that would be basically like a fixed, fixed impact model. Um, maybe just try it out and see what are what could potentially be the differences between your model and also the estimates from from the fixed uh, impact model. And also, well, I guess do you have any uh, thoughts about that, or have you already actually tried? Yeah, thank you for your comments. Actually, this model includes the county fixed effect. The first oh, difference, yeah, I use the first difference here, first difference of what the yield, the log of the yield, and first difference of the CT. So it's already controlled the time inward characteristics. So you, you already control the quantity level fixed Yes. Oh, okay, sorry, that's that, that reminder yeah. of uh, this question. Um, and I'm just saying, because like the growth results basically suggest that um, like conservation tillage is not like, it's, it's like, uh, it's not significant for corn, but a significant decreasing uh, like soybean use. Um, like maybe um, I was just thinking about maybe like it's actually decreasing yield. It could potentially still be a welfare maximization for the society. Uh, I'm just thinking maybe it's like worth considering like environmental benefits, ecosystems like benefits or um, biodiversity benefits from like the tillage. Um, like practice itself. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's making sense that like maybe it's like increasing crop yield for sure. Um, but also like to make the story like more, um, I guess, like 
comprehensive and also um, like adding a little bit of environmental uh, component to it, also considering like the environmental benefit of um, um, village conversion. Because that's, that's everything about the program. It's like a conservation, right? It's a conservation program. So um, it's very hard to just like, put it aside and um, only consider it uh, the effect on the on the deal. But I mean, like I think this is like I guess future work. Um, if you have any, uh, I guess future works you want to work on, it might be a good direction to consider sort of, like adding the environmental to it. Um, and also maybe do like a lower analysis of this this policy in addition to the deal. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, why my slides is not showing here. Okay. Can I repeat your last yeah. sentence again? Sorry. Yes, yes. I, I, yeah, definitely. I mentioned that in my paper. I control the high labor expenses and the fuel expenses. I control all of those. The expenses. Um, from USBA, county level, US Bureau of Economic Analysis, Bureau of Economic Analysis. Uh, you mean change uh, you the the cost of the the change of the cost of the expenses? I mean the input cost uh, changes. Uh, yeah, I use the difference of the difference of the uh, input expenses as one of the control uh, to kind of predict the the changes of the yield. For the incomes, I use the lags, but for the expenses, I think like it's highly related between the costs of the input and the yield. If you use more costs, you may get a higher yield. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, conservation storage adoption may affect, I mean, may you, you show that uh, conservation storage affects yield. Yeah. At the same time, it's going to affect operating costs. Right? Yes. So, um, the operating cost itself could be a dependent variable where you can think about the whole farm operation, how farm operating costs will change overall. And, and plus, you have the effect on yield. So then you can think about um, farm return. Yes. And, yes. Yes. Thank you for your points. I use, like, I also use that, like, the differences of the cost use or the lack of the cost use to predict the difference of the city adoption. So, pretty much after I got the set of variables that can predict the difference of the city adoption, I kind of get a can the city the difference of city adoption taken as exogenous condition on all of those variables. So it's kind of impact through the city adoption. I'm not sure if that's, that makes sense. 
They both can impact the CT adoption all years. I can now just drop them, then it will cause omitted variable bias. Yeah, and also if they cross the then the interesting question like the cost savings from doing the consumer is just going to outweigh the reduction in the deal. Maybe. That may be the case. I also thought about that the thing is that the data set is at the common level and that person is split by fertilizer. So you only see at the common level the fertilizer usage is this much, but not by fertilizer. So because this is, you know, kind of, and also your yield of your effect. So, um, maybe you gotta uh, think about what the county irrigation problems. So, you gotta assume that crop share is fixed, and, you know, so if every input used to grow other crops are all held on. And then, when under the facility, it will be an option. So, input changes only. So, yeah, so it gets yeah. yeah, it's not uh, the perfect data for this contact. Yeah. And then the group of farmers who planted in 2005 with different from those who planted in 2005. So, those are changing the time of the time. So, Thank you for all the comments and questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very much.